When Alaskans created the Permanent Fund, it was a grand experiment. Other oil provinces had tried to preserve some of their wealth for future generations. Few, if any, had succeeded. Money! It's a gas. Grab that cash with both hands and make a stash. Nine years after statehood, the oil strike at Prudhoe Bay in 1968 ushered in a new era of prosperity for the 49th state. But while the state treasury received $900 million in lease bonuses the next year, the money was quickly spent, and Alaskans worried that more oil wealth would slip through their fingers. They became determined to cushion the boom and bust cycle that had plagued states and countries with natural resource wealth. For several years, legislators and residents debated what to do with the pending windfall. Eventually, they settled on a long-term savings account, an idea first put into legislation by Governor Keith Miller in 1970. Voters in 1976 decided on a constitutional amendment to set aside 25 percent of royalty and lease income from the oil fields. Today, the question is whether fund income can be used for government. As budget reserves shrink, the day of reckoning approaches on the state fiscal gap, and policymakers are revisiting the circumstances surrounding the creation of the permanent fund. Perhaps no other part of state government has undergone as much scrutiny. The investment policies gradually have been liberalized over the years, growing the fund to $25 billion and beyond, exceeding the dreams of its founders. The dividend program established in 1982 has given every resident a share of the oil wealth. But the dividend also has made for complicated discussions about the state's tax structure and about the civic obligations of Alaskans. Money. Get back. I'm all right, Jack. Keep your hands off of my stack. And as 2003 came to a close, there were competing proposals for constitutional amendments to change the structure of the fund or the dividend. If there's any consensus, it's that Alaska, due to the foresight of a generation of political leaders, has built itself an asset that is the envy of other states. The size of the permit fund at over 25 billion is one of the 50 largest public funds in the country. We rank in the top 300 globally in terms of internally managed assets. We're, we are one of the largest asset management companies in the world. That's private sector, public sector, whatever. We are certainly one of the largest, world's largest asset pools. And as such, um, even though we're in Juneau, Alaska, we get people from all over the world who come through our offices in Juneau and uh, make special visits to make us aware of their services and what, the, what they can do for us. When we have people from Wall Street who visit our offices, um, particularly those for the first time, and they walk into our trading room, um, some people are, are physically, you can see, taken aback. Sometimes you know, I get the verbal comments. They're literally shocked that our trading room looks every bit as modern, as professional as theirs. And in fact, technology-wise, uh, we're not only the equal of, of many of our investment management firms, but uh, we've actually been ahead of the curve. The fund has, has grown from being a very small bond fund to being a very risk-averse fund during its middle years to then moving in the 90s to be a more uh, to be a fund more reflective of the market to today being a fund that has investments in pretty much all major asset classes. Our timing was impeccable. We were invested in bonds at the time. Bonds, bonds were doing wonderfully. Uh, interest rates were soaring to 20 percent. And then at the time we got into, into the stock market, the market ran through a bull market of nearly 20 years. You need a yen to make your mark if you want to make money. You need the luck to make a buck if you want to be a gaddy. Rough child. You gotta be cool on Wall Street. Gotta be cool on Wall Street.
how sweet when your index is low. I think we must maintain the integrity of the fund by prohibiting constitutionally uh, any investment in a speculative market, such as the, the stock market, Mr. Speaker. I think we can remember that infamous $900 million that's no longer with us. Out of that $900 million, in 1972, uh, we invested $18 million in the stock market, Mr. Speaker. As of July 31, 1975, we are out of the stock market, Mr. Speaker. So our actual loss was in excess of $10 million, which is more than 50 percent of the original investment. And I don't wish to see that happen again. I don't think we can guarantee a rate of return in a constitutional amendment. Or if we do, I'm very much afraid then we're saying that the only investments that this fund might ever make would be government securities. And I don't think that would serve to diversify the state's economic base. In line 26 states specifically that the investments will be designated by law. And of course what's contemplated here is that the, the next legislature, should this constitutional amendment be ratified, uh, will designate uh, the specific investment program for the permanent fund. Under the present uh, statutes to deal with investment of surplus funds, the Commissioner of Revenue could buy stock on the stock market. He informed us yesterday he hasn't done that, and uh, so we, we wanted to assure that this, this bill did not authorize that kind of investment, and it doesn't. It mostly uh, authorizes investment into instruments of the federal government, like uh, treasury notes, or bills to draw interest and are mostly short term. The Department of Revenue has had interim management of the fund, which today totals around $90 million. 100% of the fund is invested in a variety of securities, and those investments are bringing the state about a 9% rate of return. That 9% income is by law returned to the state's general fund. Investment policy of the permanent fund is established by statute, so it was the legislature that had the heartburn. Uh, the debates between uh, Oral Freeman and Hugh Malone uh, about how conservatively should the fund be invested. I think Oral carried the, carried the day in the early going, and that's why the fund was all fixed income. He was very, very conservative. At issue was Freeman's opposition to a provision of the bill to allow the permanent Ford Board of Trustees to invest in the stock market, and Malone's argument that investment options are currently too limited. There's a principle involved in investment, Mr. Speaker, like a lot of other things, and that if you want to win big, you have to gamble big. But also, at the same time you stand to win big, you stand to lose big. There is a uh, guideline laid down in the law. I have no particular reason to believe that the trustees will, will try to avoid that guideline. The guideline is that this fund shall be managed first for the protection of the principal and only secondly for the generation of earnings. In the end, Freeman lost a close vote to delete the stock market language. The bill then passed on a 26 to 8 ballot. Corporation was established, uh, I think the bill passed on St. Patrick's Day in 1980. Yeah, I always remember. And uh, the first board, I think, uh, uh, was organized shortly thereafter. Elmer was its uh, leader first chairman of the board, and he and the rest of the members of that original board uh, had a lot of discussions about how to organize the fund, and it, you know, it quickly became apparent to them that one of the first things that they had to do that hadn't been taken care of when, when the legislation was written originally was that the fund wasn't protected against inflation. So they came up with two ways to do that. One was the, the inflation proofing, which is taking a portion of the earning and adding it to principal, but the other one was to allow a portion of the fund to be invested in assets that appreciate so they can combat uh, inflation. We got into stocks in uh, July of 1983. It was the first uh, day that the fund invested in the stock market, and shortly thereafter they got into real estate, and we bought our first couple of uh, real estate buildings. But I think there was a general sense that uh, we didn't know what either the legislative or the public response might be if the fund lost money. There was a quarter in which the fund early on lost money. Uh, and we did get calls uh, from the legislature asking what is going on. Uh, but uh, the staff and the trustees had the ability to explain it. The debate largely centered around the goal that had been established by one of the first chairmen, uh, Elmer Rasmussen, which was a 3% real rate of return, which meant 3% after inflation. 
And then uh, we had a very small investment in equities. And when I came on the board, my position was you can't make a 3% real rate of return without an increase in the equities. It had been um, 80 to 85 percent in fixed income. If this was late 1987, uh, we still only had 13 percent of the fund invested in the stock market. We were a very conservative fund. So the permanent fund, while it grew, uh, and while it uh, performed well relative to its peers, relative to to funds with a sim with a similar asset allocation, uh, really left a lot of dollars on the table because we were risk averse. And my gosh, the look I got when I said foreign equities! I had worked up a great big paper, about seven or eight pages, all the benefits of it to the retirement fund, uh, the permanent fund. I was told point blank, nobody wanted to hear it. <laughs> It was the beginning of globalization, and uh, people weren't really sure exactly what the difference between domestic and international or global uh, was. And uh, it, it was something that the legislature took a long time pondering. Ten years ago, about 75% of the listed securities of the world were in the United States. At the present time, it is scarcely 50% and it is decreasing all the time. So the first argument for international investments is that we don't want to be shut out of investment in half the world. From about 1986 through 1989, when we began the uh, ramp up, there was a lot of internal work, a lot of gnashing of teeth, a, a lot of asking experts, is this really right. After the foreign equity markets had almost doubled across the board against the uh, U.S. equity markets, there suddenly was a change of opinion. <laughs> now that was a big... So we gradually moved into foreign equities. The fact of the matter is that permanent fund investment policy changes very, very slowly. It's a very conservative institution in that sense. We're happy with a lot of singles. If we hit a double, we're euphoric. Uh, but we don't swing for the fences and we don't strike out. So it's been liberalized in that they have more investment options, foreign domestic stocks and bonds and real estate, but not liberalized to the point that you're going to make a bad investment in Alaska just because it happens to be in Alaska. And we still viewed ourselves as, as uh, pretty much plain vanilla, even though we were adding asset classes and, and becoming a much more sophisticated fund. Uh, and maintaining that course during the most heady markets that any of us have ever seen, particularly when we look back on it in, in hindsight after the collapse of 2000. When Black Friday comes. And people ask me, how do you handle a bear market? And it starts with the discipline during the bull market. For example, while there was a lot of discussions, the Permanent Fund Board of Trustees did not get caught up in the, in the uh, technology mania. They did not get caught up in the new economy. Uh, September of uh, 2002 was the worst quarter in the history of the permit fund, down in 7.5%. And it was down so far uh, that our commitment, the fund's commitment to equities was below the bands and it required a reallocation. I think the, uh, the board meeting was, I believe, October 10th. Uh, and uh, the recommendation was to commit $750 million to the uh, U.S. equity market. Think about it, two and a half year bear market, worst quarter in the history of the fund, but the board was committed to staying the course in that discipline. If you compare us to industry peers, um, overall uh, the fund's return has been uh, perhaps a little shy of what uh, others have seen, but our equity allocation has been nowhere close to what some funds, uh, uh, endowments, uh, and uh, foundations have had. Um, you know, our equity allocation only in the last uh, three or four years um, hit uh, 50 percent, and it's not uncommon to see equity allocations of 60 and 70 percent. Up to 5% of the fund, you can invest in anything that you think is prudent outside of the authorized list of investments, um, demonstrating that after uh, 
you know, 20, nearly 25 years of operation, there was enough trust uh, between the legislature and the board that, uh, that, that they were allowed to do that. Well, today, we're still a legal list fund. The legal list is now almost 2,000 words long. And uh, it's actually very cumbersome. And when you look at other funds, other funds managed by the state, the retirement funds, for example, the investment charge there is simply expressed in terms of the prudent expert rule. It's four lines and 50 words long. And so we probably come to a point in the history of the permanent fund where we ought to think about uh, moving from the long legal list to the more modern prudent expert, prudent investor rule. I'm concerned about the laundry list and what it does to the ability to increase the uh, rate of return um, for the permanent fund. What have we learned since we got legal permission? We've learned that 5% is really a limiter and doesn't really allow us to take advantage of the ever-changing financial markets. Will there be a day where the legislature says, permanent fund, prudent investor, go out there and do it? They should, is the answer.